Hey, happy Sunday, Rock family and friends. It is so good uh, to gather together this morning, even though we are scattered uh, in homes and even the nations of the earth. Man, it's a joy to be together with you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan. I'm the children's youth and college pastor here. Uh, and I want to let you know two exciting things. Uh, number one, I know I'm very biased, but I want to celebrate our children's team uh, who is live right now in our CM Zoom room. I tell you, if you're a parent of young kids or know somebody with young kids who might want something for them to do on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., uh, email jlint at rockofgraceville.com uh, and they'll get connected with a secure link to uh, have an age-specific Bible teaching and community. Um, it's great. And the number two thing I want to let you know about as we're closing out a series this morning, it's kind of been an informal series in our response to uh, these unprecedented times we're in uh, called Be the Church. And we've been giving practical tools on how to be the church, really to be a church that looks like Acts chapter two, uh, when they met not primarily in a building, but house by house. And we'd love to resource you and equip you with that. I'm gonna close that out this morning, uh, but next week, I'm so excited. Uh, we're going to be diving into First Peter as a church family. Peter uh, wrote to a church that was scattered across the Roman Empire in exile, experiencing a high degree of suffering. Uh, and he writes this beautiful book called First Peter about who we become in moments of suffering, in moments of hard times. And we're going to call that series Character in Crisis. Pastor Bob's going to launch that next week. But hey, uh, why don't you open your Bibles to Psalm 103 uh, verses 1 through 4. We also, if you need it, have comments uh, or notes in the comment section. Uh, and, and we're excited to, to read this together this morning. So Psalm 103 verse 1 says this, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins. Come on, is anyone thankful that Jesus is the one that forgives all of our sins? He heals all of our diseases, and he redeems our life from the pit. Man, if you're sitting next to someone, why don't you just turn to them and say, pit. Uh, or if you're by yourself, text someone. They might think it's weird, but hey, it's a good conversation starter. Uh, we are going to talk this morning about the pit, the valley, the hard times that I'm sure everyone who's watching this has faced in their life or probably is facing in this moment. And we're going to talk about how God redeems us in the pit. So let me pray for us as we open up the word this morning. Jesus, we thank you um, for every one of us that's in a hard time, facing a hard time. God, we pray for your grace to be with us this morning. I pray for everyone who's watching this right now um, that has had things surface in their heart this week that have been uncomfortable uh, maybe parts of their heart they didn't quite know were there. I just want to pray for you. You know, if, you, if you're watching this, why don't you just keep your eyes closed? Maybe put your hand on your heart or put your hands out in front of you like you're going to receive uh, a gift from the Father this morning. God, I pray for your comfort as we bring our honest selves to you this morning, as we bring our question marks this morning, as we bring areas of our life that are in the pit, in the valley, in the hard season, we trust that you can redeem us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one of the biggest obstacles uh, to our growth in our discipleship to Jesus is facing the reality that life is hard. And life is hard. And we're going to spend the first part of this message talking about uh, maybe just naming and describing some of the ways that life is hard. But don't worry, there's going to be hope. Uh, and the second half, we're going to talk about how Jesus redeems us and shapes us and transforms us when life is hard. Uh, but one spiritual writer I love says this. He says, there must be, and if we are honest, there will always be at least one situation in our lives that we cannot fix control, explain, change, or even understand. What is that thing in your life right now? We all go through massive hard seasons, but I've learned following Jesus, there tends to be one situation, one area in our life that just doesn't make sense, and it's hard. For the disciples in John chapter 6, 
uh, they've been following Jesus and they've seen some pretty miraculous things. They've seen Jesus by John 6 turn water into wine. They've seen him walk on water. Uh, they've seen him heal the sick. They've seen him make some uh, spectacular pronouncements about who he is and the authority he has. Uh, they've seen him uh, do some amazing and by the time we get to John 6, there's this massive crowd around him. Uh, many scholars think it could be the crowd that he fed the 5,000 loaves to, so, or 5,000 men that he fed the loaves to. So with that wife, women, uh, women children, I mean, 10,000 people, uh, and they're gathered around him. And for the disciples, it's this miraculous moment. It's just been getting better and better and better. And then Jesus gives this weird teaching. And he says, if you want to really be my disciple, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the disciples are like, what is this? Like, like a zombie movie? Eat your flesh, drink your blood? Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Uh, in John 6, verse 52, it says, so the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And verse 53, so Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. I mean, I just, I want to pause here because I want us to capture the weirdness of this moment. This is weird. I think as Christians, we're so used to the practice of communion, which we now know Jesus is pointing towards where we eat bread and drink juice or wine as a celebration of Jesus's death and resurrection. But in this moment, this is very strange. It's not only strange in and of itself, um, but it's also offensive to Jewish culture. Um, it's offensive to talk about the drinking of blood, especially to Jewish ears. So this is a what the heck moment and everyone leaves. Uh, literally everyone leaves. In John 6, verse 66, it says of this, because of this, many disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asks the 12. There were thousands of people around Jesus. Thousands leave and only 12 remain. So Peter, or Jesus turns to the 12 and says, do you also wish to go away? And verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life life. We've all had moments in our discipleship to Jesus where things are confusing. When it's like, what the heck is going on? We've seen miracle after miracle after miracle. And now this circumstance, this hard thing, what the heck, Jesus? Uh, we've had moments that are disillusioning where we learned that following Jesus was one way. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, what is this? And, and it's, it's, it's strange, it's confusing, and it's really easy to think that it's not Jesus in those moments. It's really easy to think, man, Jesus was in the miracles, but in this weird, confusing, disillusioning moment, it's not him. But here's the hope that John chapter 6 gives to us, is that it's the very word of the Lord that comes to us sometimes in the form of a confusing moment, in a hard moment. And in fact, moments like these, moments where it's hard, are actually opportunities for us to step up into a deeper, more mature level of discipleship to Jesus. And really what I think Peter's saying, when Peter says, uh, Jesus basically asks, are you leaving also? Peter looks at Jesus and said, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. I almost think Peter's saying, Jesus, this is a hard teaching. I don't understand this, but I still trust you and there's nowhere else that I can go. Can we, in the hard moment, look in the face of Jesus and say, hey, I don't understand this Jesus, but you alone have the words of eternal life. I have learned to trust you in the miracle, but now I'm going to trust you in the hard moment. Friends, can we look at Jesus and say this for the hard thing that's going on in our life, whatever that may be at this moment? You know, Morgan and I got an awesome opportunity after we got married. Uh, someone gave us a huge uh, financial gift and we were able to go on our dream uh, honeymoon to Italy. Um, now, if you have been to Italy, I would love to have a conversation with you. Man, that place is amazing. Uh, and we saw some beaches. We saw some amazing old buildings, learned a lot of history. But the best part was the gelato. 
Okay, there is nothing like Italian gelato. Like, like we can have a fight if you think there's something better on this planet than Italian gelato. I mean, we got to the point where we'd eat it as a dessert for breakfast, a dessert for lunch, a dessert for dinner, and then a dessert for our dessert. Like, it's so good. Um, but then we got home, and I'll never forget the first morning after getting home from our honeymoon, walking out in the kitchen, and there was no gelato in my kitchen. There was just dirty dishes, dirty laundry, some rotting food in the fridge that we forgot about that smelled really bad. Uh, the biggest <laughs> obstacle in our life is accepting the reality that no honeymoon, even our honeymoon with Jesus, lasts forever. One spiritual writer that I love named Ronald Rollheiser, he says it this way, and again, I think this quote uh, should be in the comments if you want to read along, but he says this, he says, honeymoons are real are powerful and afford us on this side of eternity with one of the better foretastes of heaven. Because of that, they are not easy to let go of permanently. Inside every one of us, there is the lingering itch to experience that kind of city yet one more time. That itch is made stronger by the fact that all of our commitments, including our marriage, can often seem bland and flat when measured against the intensity of a honeymoon. Uh, Pete Scazzaro says it this way. He says, turning toward our pain is counterintuitive. But get this, the heart of Christianity is, the way, is that the way to life is through death. The pathway to resurrection is through crucifixion. We have to endure suffering in hard times to see the glory on the other side. And I am so guilty of this. When it gets hard, uh, it's easier to use cheap theology to get through hard times. Now, I don't want to accidentally offend anyone. So I just want to say, I've said these things too. Has anyone said in a hard moment, man, God's just going to get me through it. Or something like, man, God just has a reason for everything. It's going to be okay. Um, I want to say with love and with grace and understanding that I've said those things too, sometimes that can be a cheap theology excuse because um, God doesn't always get us out of the pit right away. Instead, Psalm 103, he redeems us in it. God doesn't always get us out of the pit right away. Instead, he redeems us in it. He changes us in it. We become someone in hard times. We become more like Jesus. And uh, we, we sometimes, I think, I don't know if it's because we're American or what it is, but we have a, an escapist understanding of the pit, of the valley of hard times. We think it's God's job to get us out of the hard times when really it's God's job. We, we need a redemptive understanding of hard times. We don't need an escapist understanding of hard times. We need a redemptive understanding of hard times. Pete Grieg says it this way. He says, God doesn't hella lift us out of the valley, but he parachutes right into it with us. Instead of seeing our pain as something to get through, we need to see it as something that shapes us, forms us, molds us, Whatever hard situation, whatever pit, whatever area of your life is in the valley right now, what if that's the potter's wheel that Jesus is using to shape you and form you into his image? Instead of letting our pain frustrate us, we need to let our pain form us. And here's what that means. Every painful moment. We as, as just, again, that's why I said it's, it's an invitation to the next level of discipleship to Jesus. His, his first level discipleship is the miracles and it's awesome. The second level, so to speak, and I'm using a metaphor, uh, is that we get to see our pain and hard times through the lens of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Every hard moment becomes an opportunity for us to die to something in us that doesn't look like Jesus and rise again to some new way of being and loving in the world. For a Christian, every painful moment becomes a crucifixion where we die to something in ourselves. And every time God redeems us, we are resurrected to a new way of being and loving in the world. 
And here's what I'm convinced. I think when we first come to know Jesus, uh, we kind of think that our life is like a Marvel superhero movie. Isn't it like Marvel superhero movies? And we think that we are the Marvel superhero. And I know when I first became a Christian, it was like, man, like, I can do, I can see miracles and awesome stuff happens and I got Jesus on my side. Like, this is amazing. But then we grow up a little bit and we realize, man, I'm not that awesome. I screw up sometimes. I make some mistakes. But then I think we trade it and instead of viewing our life as a Marvel superhero movie where we're the superhero, uh, we start to view life still as a superhero movie, but where Jesus is the superhero. And we are the damsel in distress, the weak one that Jesus comes and saves. But I want to say, friends, I don't think our life is a Marvel superhero where we're the superhero. I don't think life is a Marvel superhero movie where Jesus is the superhero. What if our life is a romance? Here's what I mean by that. And this is an extended analogy, but I think it's going to make sense in a moment here. Uh, you know, I, growing up, I just had a younger brother, so I didn't, uh, I never really watched rom-coms or romantic movies. So when I got married, uh, Morgan realized I hadn't seen a lot of her favorite movies. So we started, we, we spent a season, a few months, uh, where every date night we just watched a new rom-com. And here's what I learned in that season, is that every rom-com is the exact same. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Every single romantic comedy, every single romance movie, they're the same, okay? They open up with this panoramic shot of a city, whether it's Manhattan, Chicago, San Francisco, there's fun music in the background, and then we meet uh, this girl who usually works at some, you know, she has a, a coffee in her hand and she's working at some high-class Manhattan apartment building, and then we meet a guy who's like a jerk, uh, and then we look at them and we're like, man, they could never end up together, yet, Something in us wants them to end up together, okay? And then, by the end of the movie, they end up together, and it's a happy ending. That, my friends, is every rom-com, in a nutshell. Um, and, but there's always a point in any romance movie when the love gets hard, and you think it's not going to work out. And something happens that puts the guy and the girl against each other, and they're, they're fighting, and it's awkward. And, and I, I love, I, I will admit it, I am a little bit of a romantic. I love to watch rom-coms and romance movies in that moment because I'm watching the main characters. And here's what I'm saying when I'm looking at them. I'm saying, will they choose love? Are they going to say yes when it's hard? Are they going to say yes and choose love over the suffering and over the, the frailty and human failure in one another. And there's something in our human heart where we love it. When they end up choosing love and it's a happily ever after. What if, friends, our life with Jesus is actually a romance? Where he created us to be with him forever in eternity, but we messed up. And you look at Jesus and you look at someone like you or like me, and it's like, how are they ever going to end up together? They're totally not right for each other. We're so messed up and Jesus is so holy. How does that work? But what if the Father is in heaven watching your life, watching my life, and when it's hard, he's looking at us saying, will you choose? love in the middle of a hard time. And friends, this is what trials do to us. This is what happens in the pit, is we learn to become the type of people that say yes to love instead of bitterness. We say yes to Jesus' love instead of anger. We say yes to Jesus' love instead of disappointment. We say yes to Jesus' love instead of disillusionment and crumbling and despair. And friends, this is what happens. Love becomes pure when it's chosen in suffering because it's not selfish anymore. Friends, if we can say yes to Jesus when it's hard, it becomes pure because then it's not about my life and my circumstances going well. It's about him and how much he loves me and how much I want to love him back. Love becomes pure in suffering. When it's chosen in suffering, when we can say yes to Jesus when there's no emotion anymore, that's when love becomes real. Uh, when we can say yes to love, love becomes beautiful when it's chosen in the middle of dishes 
and laundry and all the normal things that you and I face day to day because the most real things are the most beautiful things and love becomes beautiful when it's chosen in the mundaneness of life. You know, Song of Solomon paints that picture of this romance that we're on with with the Lord and how he loves us and cherishes us and romances us. And it ends with this beautiful verse that says, who is that coming out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Friends, this is my commitment and I want it to be our commitment as a church. Will we come out of a hard season leaning more on Jesus and not less? Will we come out of a hard season, the pits of our lives, loving Jesus more, responding less in bitterness and anger and frustration and disillusionment, but becoming more and more in love with the one who created us and saved us? Real quick, I want, I'm going to close with this. This has been, I, I kind of wanted to give us a theology and an understanding because uh, sometimes suffering is hard and I don't want to negate the reality of anyone's hard times. Uh, some of us are in greater objective suffering than others. I wanted to give us a theology for understanding, but uh, I want to give us real quick five steps and I'm going to go through this in about 30 seconds of what to do when it's hard. And we're going to post this in the comments. I want to encourage you. Uh, Morgan and I have gone through these steps recently and it's been so helpful to understand what's going on in our life. We even think uh, we'll probably do this in every major transition season, but it's a way to think about suffering through the lens of Jesus's death, resurrection, and that whole story to his 40 days on the earth, and then his ascension to heaven, and then Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit gets poured out, which if you're following on our natural calendar is right where we are. We're in that 40 days before the ascension in Pentecost um, on, our, on our church year calendar. So um, here, are the, here are the five steps, and these come from Ronald Rollheiser, um, who I quoted earlier, a great author. Um, but step one is this, when you're facing a hard season, uh, step one is the Good Friday step. It's the day of Jesus's crucifixion. Name your deaths. Name the things that you're dying to, either circumstances in your life that are no more or things internally um, that are falling away. Number two, claim your births. Uh, That's the Easter Sunday step. What are the new things that God's giving birth to in your life? The new things, even in your heart, that God's resurrecting uh, from the dead. And maybe there's going to be things on that list that you're agreeing for and claiming and believing for that aren't quite alive yet. Number three is the 40-day step. Grieve what is lost and adjust to the new reality. Take time to grieve those things that are transitioning. Four, uh, this is the ascension step. Do not cling to the old, but let it ascend and give you its blessing. Learn to release the old things in your life to the hands of a loving father, the things that aren't here anymore. And then number five, this is the step of Pentecost. Accept the spirit of the life that you are in fact, living. So I want to encourage you, if you are single, take those steps, pray through them sometime this week. If you're married, hey, here's a free date night conversation, okay? I love you, church. Let me pray for you, and we'll close. Jesus, I pray for every person who's in the pit right now, that you would encourage them, be with them, love them, support them, encourage them. May we be a church that chooses to love you even when it's hard. So we love you, God. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen, church. We'll see you at 7 at seven this week, 6.30, Worship with the Word, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We love you, bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.